I dance and I move my hands a lot, so this is going to be a bit of a dance show. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for being here, and I'm really glad to be in this crowd. It's amazing, and it's amazing to see some familiar faces. Um, I am from Generation R. Generation R is uh, seven months old, and we have had one client, and we are learning and growing. Um, and today, I'm here to talk about some of the lessons we've learned, and I'm calling playing in the wilderness. But first, I want to ask, how would you define a best friend? Best friend is probably somebody that you would spend quality time with, somebody that you share some values, um, and somebody that generally is really fun to be around and you've known for a while. And now I want to ask another question. Who has used Snapchat? Some people, yes. And in, on Snapchat, a best friend is, is defined as somebody who you have the longest streak of snaps with. So when I first learned about this, this really bothered me as somebody who really cares about friendship. I'm one of my best friends actually here. And I, and it was, and this in general, this entire concept of how technology is coming into our lives and businesses uh, has made me a very frustrated engineer um, and roboticist. And so this is why me and a couple of my co-founders have decided to start Generation R. So about 75% of enterprises, uh, as I'm sure you know, are employing or are about to employ big data. For 69 manufacturing employees in Canada, there's one robot. So this is clearly happening, and clearly these technologies are being uh, incorporated into our businesses. And so, and, and so by that extension, they are, challenging, they are offering some other definitions for some of the really critical concepts that we, had, that we have in our, in our business and the operation of businesses. And we basically, at Generation R, we want to make sure that, the con that these concepts, the equivalent of friendship in business, is defined in a way, is developed in a way that is ethical, uh, from a technology perspective, from a business perspective, and also from a policy perspective. So, thank you. <laughs> but when we started this, um, I found ourselves in a very interesting spot. Despite the fact that we've been in this field um, as researchers for a little while, I found, I found myself in a very unique, I had unique feelings, but I couldn't really describe what they were in. They were, until I read uh, Brené Brown's book on, called Braving the Wilderness. Great book. And I realized uh, we are in the wilderness, and it's quite exciting. So Brené Brown defines wilderness as um, an untamed, unpredictable place of solitude and searching. Uh, it's so exciting. <laughs> and one, another thing that she says is that in the wilderness, we have to deal with a lot of paradoxes. And so situations, and in these paradoxes, we have to uh, voice our opinion and say where, where we're at and what, what, what we stand for. So I looked at our field, I looked at robo-ethics, I looked at AI ethics, I was like, yep, we are def I definitely have to live a paradox every single day when I'm looking at how are we going to be balancing human values versus what machines are capable of? How are we going to be balancing the values of individuals versus values of, the, of a system, of a business? But I also found not only the work that we do, we are in a paradox, but also in the business as we're communicating what we're doing to an anybody else who's using AI or robotics, I realized that we also have to live through paradoxes. Um, sometimes innovation and ethical rules and ethical considerations can seem as uh, paradoxical. Sometimes uh, people can think that in order to be able to innovate, you need to be free and like really explore. You don't necessarily need to you know, abide by the laws and the rules. It's, it's a valid perspective and valid thought, and so we just have to be able to navigate that. Another thing is uh, sometimes ethical questions can be fuzzy and quite open-ended, and you know, it, it never, there's really never right answer. So how do you, as a business, offer pra practical solutions to that? So I was, I was reading a book, uh, Braving the Wilderness, and in the book, um, Brandon Brown says you have to be braving the wilderness. And by that, she means you have to be authentic, you have to be transparent, and you have to be genuine about uh, where you stand and who you are and what's your opinion. But then I thought, OK, that's what we've been doing. I don't think that's 100% successful. And so I tried to come up with another analogy. Uh, and being the creative ambassador in the group, per se, I decided that we should be playing in the wilderness. And 
So I'm just going to share. I'm, I've just started playing in the wilderness. And so I'm just going to share some of the ways that we do it um, and what that means to me. Um, and so one of them is that we have to jug juggle and work with a lot of different definitions. So you know, you go to a company and you talk about ethics. And so for a data scientist, uh, when we're talking about ethics, uh, we have talked about like what does fairness mean between the concept of the algorithm and the biases that they have. When we're talking for an executive level person, um, fairness can mean a completely different thing within the context of what they what they're thinking about for their employees. Uh, that would be a similar thing for somebody in human resources. So we have to be able to be, uh, be comfortable with juggling all of these different definitions and playing around with them to make sure how we can best communicate. Another thing is that we need to create our own sandboxes. So um, in, in, in order to be able to actually do what we do, we have to make sure that we come up, we understand what the businesses uh, that are implementing AI robotics are doing um, and really define what, uh, connect what we're doing to their sandbox, and so define it within that sandbox, and play within their sandbox, and make it make sense to them. Um, and finally, we have to be able to learn, quickly start playing early. Uh, as much as being in the wilderness and being in a situation where you're alone, um, it's hard. It's hard to start playing quickly because um, you're alone. <laughs> but you have. To, we have. There. We have had to step out of that and find anybody who is. Um, willing to play with us and to and go for it and engage with them and communicate with them and juggle and create the sandbox and play as much as we can. And so um, that's what we've been doing for the past few months. And I'm hoping that um, what, what Brenda Brown was talking about, uh, that it was saying that in, when you're going through the wilderness, ultimately you get to a place of true belonging. She was talking about it within the context of personal growth and true belonging. And what I'm hoping is that by playing, uh, playing in the wilderness as a company, we make sure that ethics is, uh, truly, truly belongs to the design of technology and systems and policies. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, first question. Some, oh, perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, this, this is an area that's uh, really interesting to me because I'm always working with rating and ranking systems. And in that area in particular, we always see trade-offs. Um, so when you think about the concept of ethics and trying to optimize, how should someone think about ethics versus utility to the user, and the ethics of providing utility over the ethics of, let's say, some categorical imperative, like telling the truth or what have you. Yeah, great question. I think um, there's, the, I think the user, um, I think you should look at the values of the user, basically. I mean, the user, uh, any user uh, wants to be able to ultimately have shared values with the product that they're using. And I think that's something that is going to be grow is growing as well as companies, uh, as public is more aware uh, of the technologies that we're using and are more reflective about it. But I think that uh, at least the way that we approach it is that we look at uh, what the values of the user are and the value that the technology is bringing and, it sh and try to create alignments between so when Google only lightly fades its sponsors re results and puts a small little note there that says sponsored, is that ethically correct or ethically wrong? Should that be a darker color and more brightly lit? Um, I think Google should uh, definitely talk to people about it and see uh, what they would want from engaging with users. I mean, but I think from some people's perspective, yeah, that could be, that's not what they would be comfortable with. Um, and, uh, and from some other people's perspective, um, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but I think ultimately as a company, you have to be able, when you're making these choices, I think what we realize is that you are taking some ethical risks on. And so that is unavoidable. It's not that you can avoid everything, you know. Uh, uh, but I think it's really a matter of understanding your stakeholders and choosing uh, which, what risk you're willing to take. Thanks. Yeah. Tough problem. Yeah, it is a tough problem. Should I, yeah. at the bottom of the mic, it's just turned on. Yes. That's OK. I was trying to be loud. 
Okay. There That's you good. go. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Curious to know. Oh, perfect. Uh, I was kind of wondering how much of this would play into a data strategy for a huge corporation. I mean, uh, there's everybody has a lot of data nowadays. Yeah. It's impacting a lot of people. It's making a lot more news with Yahoo's breaches, Equifax breaches. I mean, Equifax breaching, I think everybody knows about that. Yeah. Uh, would your company have uh, advice for that with regard to its ethics? So how should a company like Equifax deal with the fallout of something as catastrophic as what they experienced? Yeah. Uh, so there are, so when we're looking at the word of ethics, I mean, we, it comes, it has a close overlap. It's like security and privacy, uh, obviously. And I think Equifax falls a little bit more on that. But um, in general, this definitely integrates with um, the strategy that people should take, I mean, the companies could take with their data. And I don't think it's necessarily being integrated as much from what I have seen so far, um, because nobody really has a budget for ethics assessment, per se. <laughs> in the, in the, but I think I, what the whole, uh, the whole point, and it's also really, to be honest, it's really hard to sometimes define what that means for a company. So like, for example, we we'll deal with the issues of fairness and like interpretability and transparency. And these are some of the points that we bring to companies and really outline. Um, I think, uh, but I think that it's, it's something that I think if companies, because right now there are really no standards. There are no, there's no, but nobody that's like, yeah, you have to meet the standard to be able to like to be ethical. There are some that are being developed, but they're not really there yet. And so I think companies could totally value from taking a pro proactive approach in developing um, their pro Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> Okay. I'm curious to uh, yeah. talk to you afterwards and learn a little bit more about Facebook and your thoughts on what they're doing in terms of the fake news problem. And we should call it, not stop calling it fake news and just call it lies that are being um, put in front of us on a constant basis, um, even in Canada, which is crazy, um, and how ethics plays a role into that. So that would be a, I would love to hear, connect in with you afterwards and talk about that. Yeah. I don't want to take up time, but I'm just, thinking. Yeah. Um, a warm round of applause for Ali. What a wonderful talk. <laughs>